the a roll call. Marlene, I know, is in California. Mm -hmm, yes. <laughs> Larissa, remind me, where are you in Virginia? No. Corey <laughs> was in Virginia. Where are you from? I'm in Larissa? Idaho. Idaho? Yeah. Oh, where in Idaho? Mountain Boise? Home. Mountain Home. Like 40, 45 minutes from Boise. Danielle, did you tell me that there was actually a B'nai Noah school in Boise? Yes. Tell me that. Yeah. What, what? Me, Larissa and I had talked about that like, I don't know, one or two years ago, but I forget how the conversation ended. I wasn't able to get a hold, I think, of the person I used to have as a contact there. I think that's what happened. Hmm. Larissa, yeah. are you, do you know about that school? That's, that's a huh. Now that you mention it, I remember it being mentioned. Um, that's, that's all I've got, though. I should okay. follow back up with him. I, I that was such an amazing thought. And I, I remember yeah. Danielle telling me, and I remember Idaho. <laughs> like, I remember thinking, like, wow, in Idaho, you know, that was... The, the, oh, Chabad, cool. Do you know the Chabad Emissary there in Idaho? I know of them. I've never successfully been able to get in contact with anybody. Oh, wow. Okay, because she, she's a former student of mine. I remember speaking to her, like, like she said, it's a very, very, I mean, in terms of Jews, very, very small, scattered across the entire state. I think in, in general, the population's a bit, you know, lower. It's not like, you know, Chicago. <laughs> but, um, and, then I, and I remember mentioning to her, oh, no, there's a, there's a Noah High community. But I don't think she knew about them either. And I know Corey right now is in Cincinnati. Yeah, Corey, you're still in Cincinnati at the moment? Yes. Yes. Cincinnati. Yeah. And Cher, are you in Texas? Yes. Okay, so I got, I got, I got almost everyone correct. So it's, it's a nice gathering of, of, of the community. Very, very nice. Very, very nice. Um, so well, I was actually, I wanted to do today, we were doing Maimonides' Laws of Repentance, and then I was like, you know, I'm going to switch it to Maimonides' Laws of B'nai Noah, which would be, and then we could go back to Maimonides' Laws of Repentance. I didn't want to forget that. But then I was doing today just the, a portion in the Torah that like made me, made me think of everyone in the class. So I said, I'm going to start with that and then do that. So this is, so this week's Torah portion is... How was it written this week's? I don't know this week's when it didn't happen. Yet. That's interesting. Oh, because God says it's going to happen. Right. So I'm just like, so I'm a little confused. So we're in the, the, today's reading of the Torah was Lech Lecha, which is discussing the journey of Abraham. And at the end of this portion is when God is promising Abraham that he will have a son who will be Isaac. And we're told that this, he's not born yet. He's going to be born next to our portion. Next week he's born. <laughs> we'll learn about it over the course of the week. But today we already hear things that are going to happen in connection with his birth. And one of the things that Rashi, the classical commentator on Torah, explains, which made me think of everyone, is that so when Isaac is born, Abraham is a young, old, 100-year-old, and Sarah is 90. And of course, they've been married like forever plus. So when they claimed they had a baby, nobody believed them, or people were making fun and saying it's not really. So there was a few different things God did to counter this. One thing is that he made Isaac look like a copy, a carbon copy of Abraham. So nobody could look at Isaac and say he wasn't Abraham's kid. And something else that happened, we're told in the Midrash, is that they made a party in Isaac's honor, and all the noble women, all the nobles were invited to the party, all the important people of the generation, as Abraham was a very important person of the generation. So he had a big party with all the big people involved. And every woman that came, coincidentally, forgot to bring her nursemaid. In those days, they didn't use isomil. They didn't use prosobi. Instead, they had a literal nursemaid. That was that's where the term nursemaid comes from. That literally, the the more important, uh, we'd say, rich woman. She's not going to nurse her own baby. 
that's a modern day thing that we think that's so great. That was like, oh, that's so common. I have a woman that nurses my baby for me because I can't make a bottle of formula. So I have just a woman that's the nursemaid. And by this party, every woman forgot to bring her nursemaid. So suddenly we have all the women there, all the babies there, and they're all starving and there's no nursemaids. And Sarah says, no problem. I'm nursing my son. I can nurse all your babies. And she nursed all the babies, which of course was another testimony that, hey, this truly is her child. As we see, she can nurse. But that's the famous Midrash, the famous story that, that is known on that literal level. But it's explained on a more Kabbalistic dimension. I mean, nothing's random. You know, again, Isaac's face is already a copy of Abraham. Why did God have to do this? that all of those children that suckled from Sarah and that received Sarah's milk, the spirit of Sarah went into them. The spirit of godliness, the spirit of kindness, the spirit of sensitivity to spirituality. And we're told that every person who's ever a Noahide is a descendant of one of those children. That every Noahide comes from that extra sensitivity to godliness that Sarah gave to these children with her milk. So I was thinking today when I did the class, like, you know, as I was learning today, the portion of, of the Chumash, of the Torah of today, and I was, I was, as I did this Rashi, this famous story that Rashi's saying, and I thought of the deeper meaning, and then I thought of everyone on the class. And I was like, this is so cool to know that everyone here, Go back um, about three and a half thousand years. Your ancestors were among the elite because they were the ones that got to the party. No commoners here. And, <laughs> and somebody in your past was suckled by Sarah. Somebody, you have an ancestor that received Sarah's milk, which trickled down into the, the spiritual genetic gene constitution that created in you this extra affinity, this extra sensitivity to spirituality. So I thought that was really um, special. I know I've mentioned this idea before, but today is when I, when I read it in the Torah portion, I was like, oh my gosh, I really want to share that because I really was very, felt very like connected to the class as I was thinking of that idea. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do was the portion of Maimonides that discusses a Noahide. Now, Maimonides is a very legal work. And as such, obviously, it's discussed in, it's not, um, it's not per se overtly a philosophical, spiritual work. It's, it's laying down the law, the law's law. It almost sounds, you know, pretty rigid boxes. We're not gonna go through every one because obviously a lot is not relevant. But I just want to touch on some of the ideas that Maimonides lists. So where do you find yourself in Maimonides? So this is, this is a volume. Obviously, this is a small, battered, small print Hebrew volume. But there's plenty. Maimonides has definitely been translated into English. So this is Maimonides' magnum opus, which means he created 14 volumes that codifies all law to the degree that he called his work, it says in the Hebrew here, Mishnah Torah. Mishnah Torah means second to the Torah, which means as he writes in his introduction, you want to serve God? Have a Bible, have a Tanakh, have me, and you're good to go. I'm telling you everything you need to know to serve God. So he codifies every single law that exists exhaustively for 14 volumes. At the very end of the 14th volume is the Laws of Kings. The Laws of Kings has 12 chapters. The 11th and 12th are the chapters about Mashiach, the redemption, Messiah. As the ultimate culmination of our entire journey is to Mashiach, so the final, final, final discussion in this entire comprehensive very, very, very organized assembly of law is the laws of Mashiach. 
But right before that, that's chapters 11 and 12. Right before that, in chapters 8, 9, and 10, we speak about the Noahide. Very interesting how there's this, like, 8, 9, and 10 is the Noahide, and then 11 and 12 is Mashiach, and then we're done. So it's sort of interesting, because nothing in Maimonides was random. So it's interesting how he almost, if we want to say it, links the two together, which I could say, of course, it's just my thoughts, that maybe that's true because because the Noahide is so critical and relevant in the bringing of Mashiach. Because the Noahide is really this idea of the world recognizing God. And of course, Mashiach ultimately means that the world recognizes God. That's, that's what it means, Mashiach. That there's a world out there that recognizes God. Not a tiny little slice, the Jew, but the whole world, which is, of course, the Noahide. The Noahide represents the world recognizing God. Now, I, I, I'm not saying that's true. Because my Maimonides didn't say that's why he linked the two. It's just my thoughts. But that's what I'm thinking. All right. So let's look inside and see. We're not going to cover all three chapters today, for sure not. Um, and we're not going to do all of the laws. So in chapter 8, we get into the Noahide by speaking here about the woman that was captured in battle. That's a very interesting concept because we're told that God gave the laws to humans, us, we're human. And as such, God never asks us something we can't do, which of course the corollary is everything he asks us we can do. So whatever we're asked, whatever situation we're in, even though it might sometimes seem, oh, God can't really expect that of me. Like that, that's way too much, way too difficult, way too intense. No, no, no. God commanded it, you can do it. God never asks what you can't do. So as such, there's a law that if in the, the soldiers, of course, soldiers going out to battle is a very, um, drawing out a very animalistic element of a person. Soldiers fighting the heat of the battle is a very animal moment in a person's life. And um, if in that case, sometimes what the nations would do is they would put out their women by the battle. Maybe deliberately to seduce the men, maybe for other reasons. So if you would see such a woman there in the battle, you're allowed to actually, which sounds crazy to us, and I'm not, this is not now to get into all the laws. I really am doing this as Maimonides is. Maimonides discussing all the laws. I'm using this as Maimonides segue to the laws of Noah. You're allowed to once have relationships with this woman, and then, you ha and then you're not allowed to have any more relationships with her until you would take her as your wife, as a Jewish woman, which would mean you have to bring her back to your home. She has to live in your house for a period of three months where, of course, she cannot touch her. She just is right there. She's supposed to be mourning for her parents, for what she lost in the battle. And then she and you have to both mutually want to get married. And if you both want to get married at this point, she's agreeing, she's converting to become a full Jew from her own will and you treat and she becomes your wife like any other woman. Um, if she says, no, I don't want to be married to you. I think there might be a period of 12 months. I, I don't really remember because I'm, I'm not expert on these laws, which of course aren't practical today. I'm trying to think of just right after three months, three months, right? For a month, she's mourning her parents. For two months, she hangs out in your house. And then after those three months, if you want, and if she wants, she converts, and you marry her as a regular woman with all the rights and privileges a woman has of being married. If you say after three months, I'm not interested in her, that was just the heat of the battle moment, fine. Uh, you don't have to marry her. Um, you, can't, you can't keep her as a slave, and you can't sell her as a slave. Um, Right. Basically, I mean, if I'm understanding these laws correctly, she mourns for a month, she hangs out in her house for two months, and then you can decide if you want to marry her. If she wants to, if she becomes Jewish, you want to marry her. If you say, yeah, if she's Jewish, I want to marry her, then it's her, her course. She has to decide, yeah, I want to be Jewish, I want to marry you. Both of you agree, we're both on the same page, you get married as a complete Jewish woman, Jewish wife, like any other Jewish wife. If not, you say, I'm not interested in marrying her. I think at this point she has a 12 month period 
Or maybe you are interested in marrying her, but she's not sure if she wants to marry you. So she has a 12 month period that she's still in your house, treated respectfully, you know, let's touch her. Like, like all these three months, she's just here deciding what does she want to do. Let's say she decides, I do want to marry you. Okay, great. I want to convert. I want to marry you. She converts. They get married. No problem. But she says, I don't want to marry you. No, I really have no interest in marrying you. Okay. We send you free as long as you would like to at this moment be a Noahide, um, which is how my mind is introducing the concept here of a Noahide. Um, and she says, yeah. Yeah, I, after living in this house for so long, I see the truth. I see there's one God. I don't want idolatry anymore. Beautiful. You accept the laws of Noah. Absolutely fine. Go free. We have no rights on you. We're not taking you as a slave. We're not treating you as a slave. We're not selling you as a slave. You're a free woman. You don't want to marry him. You don't have to marry him. Because marriage obviously has to be consensual on both levels, both sides. And she goes free as a Noahide. If she says, I don't want to marry you. I don't want to be Jew. And I don't want to be a Noahide. Then we waited out for 12 months to see if over the course of the 12 months she'll change her mind. And if after 12 months she still says, I don't want to marry you. I don't want to be Jew. I don't want to marry you, which doesn't have to be. And I don't want to be a Noahide. I want to continue to serve idols. At that point, she would be killed. Because the Noahide, the, the concept ultimately of the human being on this planet is to serve God as a Noahide. And if someone is a violating any of the laws of Noah, the punishment in the time, of course, this is obviously not relevant today, but in the times of the temple, when there was a non-Jew in Israel, he had to agree to follow the laws of God, which, which for a non-Jew meant to keep the laws of Noah. And if he wasn't keeping those laws, then he was killed as if the basic rationale behind the death is, what are you in this world for? which we've touched on before. I remember a long time ago, we discussed this when we spoke about uh, Shimon and Levi killing out the city of Shechem, how they were allowed to do that. And, and this whole concept that a, a, a person's in this world to serve God. If you're not serving God, if you're refusing to serve God, here you got an education. You were in this person's house for 15 months. You got a 15 month education on serving God. You were treated honorably for 15 months and exposed to the truth about God. And you say, I'm not interested in God. Okay, I'm serving idols. Well, you're not allowed to serve idols. A human being has to serve God, and therefore she gets the death sentence. Um, that is how Maimonides then speaks about the concept of a Noahide. So he goes down into a bit of the history of it. So Moses, Moshe, he was given the entire Torah, including, of course, the concept of teaching the nations their laws. But he didn't, per se, go out and teach the nations. He was in the desert with the Jews. So he, never, he gave this over to the Jewish people, but he never went out and gave over this truth to the world. So, there's a, so we have, I wouldn't call it a dichotomy. We have two different perspectives with, in terms of the non-Jews. A non-Jew that wants to become a Jew, a non-Jew that doesn't want to become a non-Jew. <laughs> so if a non-Jew wants to be, I'm following the Maimonides, I'm giving you over what Maimonides is saying. So if a non-Jew wants to become a Jew, of course our perspective is we push them away several times, at least three times, because we really want to say, are you really sincere? Do you really want this? This is really hard. You got thousands of laws on your head. This is a, it's a difficult road and you don't have to do this. God doesn't need you to do this. God wants you to serve him as you are. You want to serve him as a Jew? It's, it's, it's not so easy. You've got a lot more obligations. So we keep pushing them away and pushing them and pushing them away. They keep coming back. They keep coming back. They keep coming back. Okay, we say they're sincere. That's it. We accept them. A Noahide is everyone else. So that everyone else, again, here also, we have two different relationships to the Noahide. And this is legal, but, but has very strong ramifications, of course, especially today, to, to you. There's a Noahide because he has to be a Noahide. There's a Noahide because he wants to be a Noahide. Meaning in the times of the temple, if any non-Jew chose to live in Israel, he had to be a Noahide, as we were just talking about this woman here. Because God says, you're living in my land. You're under the jurisdiction of the temple laws. To live in Israel, you have to be a Noahide. If you're, not, if you're gonna violate those laws, you're gonna get killed. That's the punishment. You don't want to be a Noahide? Don't live in Israel. 
<laughs> you know, it's very simple. If you live in Israel, you're under these laws, just like if you live in America, you say, well, I don't want to pay taxes, but I want to live in America. Well, I mean, who knows nowadays what you could do, but legally, <laughs> if you want to live in America, guess what? Get to pay taxes. That's the law. No, I, I'm a free thinker. I don't want to pay taxes. You don't have a choice. You live in America, you can't pay taxes. You got to stop at a red light. I don't want to stop at a red light. I never want to stop at red lights. Well, guess what? They have cameras nowadays. You got to stop at red lights. That's it. That's the law. So in Israel, I don't think they had taxes. I don't think they had red lights, but they had the laws of Noah. Of course, they also had the Torah laws for the Jews. You got to keep them. And there's consequences. And the general consequence, if you were not keeping the Noah had laws, was the death penalty. So therefore, the non-Jews that lived in Israel kept the Noah had laws. So obviously, they didn't want to die. And they chose to live in Israel. They knew this up front. Nobody was hiding it from them. So if a non-Jew lived in Israel, he kept the Noah had laws. We're talking under the times, ideally, when there was a functioning tribunal court, when everything worked as it was supposed to, for however many hundreds of years that lasted. It wasn't too long, but for those hundreds of years, if you were a non-Jew in Israel, you kept the laws. Do we view you as a very godly person? No, we don't. We really don't. Just like we don't view a person that pays taxes and stops at red lights as a godly person. You have to follow the laws. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get in trouble. So, I mean, we don't have the death sentence here for those acts, but we still don't want to get in trouble. So we follow, we pay our taxes and we stop at red lights. So in those days in Israel, the non-Jew kept the Noachide laws. He didn't want to die. So we don't view those non-Jews per se as necessarily spiritual people. They might have been spiritual people. They might have chosen to go to Israel because they want to serve God as a Noachide. But not necessarily. They might have just decided they want to live in Israel. It's a good company, country. It has a nice climate, prosperous economy. They're surrounded by nice people, honest people. They wanted to live there. No problem. Keep the Noahid laws. No problem. I want to live here. But then there was the person that chose to be a Noahide, not in the times of the temple, not when there was any coercion, not when there was a death penalty if they didn't just someone who chose to connect on that level to God. And that's who we call, who really the term is, as Maimonides calls it, Hasidei Umos Olam, which means the righteous of the nations of the world. So a Noahide is both groups. The, the non-Jew who's living in Israel, because this is, he, he, it's great for his business now, he's very successful in his business, he's in this country, it's really helping him, and he's keeping the laws to be able to live in country is a Noahide. He's a Noahide. He's keeping the laws of Noah. The non-Jew who's voluntarily keeping those laws is also a Noahide. But the non-Jew who's voluntarily keeping those laws has another additional title that obviously you all have, Chaside Umos Ha'olam. Chaside Umos Ha'olam meaning the righteous among the nations of the world. So why is this person called the righteous? as versus the, the guy who has that lucrative business in Israel, because he's doing it because he wants a relationship with God. There's no coercion. There's no need. Nobody's forcing him. No one can compel him. But he says, I want a relationship with God. I want to serve God as God wants to be served. Oh, wow. So this is for real. This isn't for convenience. This isn't because you have to. Such a person is Hasidei Umos Ha'olam, from the righteous of the nations of the world. Now, within the, the non-Jew that is in Israel because he wants to be in Israel and he's keeping the Noahide laws because he wants to stay in Israel, he also has this obligation to ritually accept the laws of Noah. And I mean, again, this was like, to us, it's like, how do you do it? What do you do? But in those days, I guess it was a system set up and in front of three, like that's the most small baked in, the most small tribunal court, in front of three people, they don't have to be big rabbis, any regular three men, three Jewish men, he would have to formally accept upon himself to keep the laws of Noah. And when the person does so, and again, the person could be doing so purely for convenience, purely for lucrative reasons, up front, he could say this. He's not fooling anyone. I'm, I'm doing this because... I want to live in Israel now. It's the most convenient place for me for whatever reason. No problem. You were willing to accept the laws of Noah? Absolutely. I know that's, my, that's what I have to do here. I'm not looking for some die. 
great. So in front of a little court of three, you have to formally accept these laws. I formally accept them. At this point, this person gets a title called a ger toishav. A ger toishav is a ger. Now the word ger, as I'm sure you might know, generally means convert. But a ger toishav does not mean a convert. A ger toishav means a non-Jew who's a toshav. A toshav means a settler. He's a uh, ger, meaning ger literally, the word ger literally means a stranger. I mean, in the literal, literal meaning, we use it to mean a convert, but the literal meaning of a ger is a stranger. So he's a foreigner. I mean, that's probably the better English translation than stranger, sorry. So the ger is the foreigner who's a toshav, who says, I want to settle with you. And we say, fine, no problem. You look like a nice person. You could settle with us. Just agree to serve God as God wants you to serve him and you can settle with us. No problem, what do I have to do? Here's the book, I'll do it, great. Stand in front of three men and affirm that you are gonna keep all the laws of Noah. I do, great. We now give you a new title. You are called a ger, the foreigner, Toshav, who is a settler in Israel. And as such, he lived in Israel, kept the laws of Noah, and did what he wanted, and he was considered a ger Toshav. He's not considered a Jew. A ger here does not mean a convert. He's not a Jew. But he was allowed to live in Israel because he was keeping the laws. So the Noahide who's in uh, wherever, New Jersey, that didn't exist at that point. <laughs> he's not a ger toshav, but he's one of the righteous Gentiles of the nations, Hasidim Musa'olam. The non-Jew who's living in Israel and out of convenience is keeping the laws because he wants to live in Israel. He is not considered the righteous among the nations but he's considered a ger toshav because he ritually accepted these laws, toshav, in order to live in Israel. Both of them are called Noahides. This is a Noahide ger toshav. This is a Noahide chasideh umosa olam. Any questions on what I said so far? Just throwing out a few terms, but this is where we're, this is, these are the laws, so we're learning the laws. Can you Mary? say that just a little bit slower, the, sure. what it's, how you say in, in Hebrew? about the righteous of the nations of the world? Haside umos ha'olam. Haside umos ha'olam means the righteous among the nations. Okay. And that's the term for everyone in this group. You're, you're, you're living examples. You are all Haside umos ha'olam, the righteous among the nations. Why are you Haside umos ha'olam? Because there's no death threat over your head that's making you keep God's laws. Why are you keeping God's laws? Because you love God and you want to connect him and you want to serve him. Because you say, this is the truth and I want to live my life in the truest, best, most godly way possible. So God says, wow, you're freely choosing to serve me. You're a Noahide because you're keeping the Noah laws, but you're not just a Noahide because you could be a Noahide for other reasons. You're chaside umos ha'olam. You are from the righteous of the nations because you're keeping the laws because you love God and want a connection to him. And conversely, the non-Jew who went to Israel and settled in Israel for personal gain and is keeping the laws, he's also a Noahide, he's keeping the laws. But we're not calling him Hasidei Umos Olam because he's not doing it for God, he's doing it for his own benefit. But he's called the Ger Toshav, because he is living in Israel and as such kept the laws, is keeping the laws. Now, again, I don't want to knock, talking about people thousands of years ago, but still you want to be respectful. I don't want to knock any non-Jew that lived in Israel. It is very possible that maybe there was a, a non-Jew who said, hey, I want a relationship with God and I want to move to Israel because I want to be close to God, and I want to serve him in Israel. So that person would be Hasidi Umos Olam and a Ger Toshav. It's possible. It's totally possible. We're sort of looking at it. Maimonides was legal. So legalistically, oh, you moved to Israel for your own benefit, and you have to keep the laws. Well, you're outside Israel. You don't have to. So we know you're doing it just for God's sake. It's very simple. There's no coercion. There's no reason for you to do it. It's only for the sake of God. But it could be that somebody moved to Israel and did it for the sake of God, that they could have both titles. Obviously, God knows the truth. We're just speaking in the you know, very black and white legal perspective. Any other questions on this? 
Okay, so going on. Now this person who is keeping the laws as a Hasidic Umos Olam, you, Maimonides writes, have a portion of Olam Haba. You have a portion in the world to come, which is an interesting discrimination that Maimonides makes between the Noahide that's living in Israel for his own personal benefit and the Noahide probably outside Israel who's serving God because he wants to. So the person who's in Israel because he has this, I don't know, he's, he's, he's whatever, I don't know, he's a fisherman and he's catching the best fish there. And he's keeping the laws of Noah because he wants to stay alive and he's catching the fish and he's, 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 he's an honest person. He's honestly keeping the laws of Noah. He's an honest Ger Tosha. He's living in Israel and a, a lucrative fisherman. He doesn't have a portion in Olam Haba. Olam Haba means the world to come. He doesn't have a portion in Olam Haba because again, he's not doing it for God. He's doing it because he wants to live in Israel. He wants to stay alive. He's a law abiding person. So he's keeping the laws. I and mean, obviously, if he's really objected, he would fish somewhere else, but he's not per se doing it for God at all. So he doesn't have a portion in Olam Haba. He doesn't have a portion in the world to come, even though he's keeping all the laws. But the non Jew, who is the Hasid de Umos Olam, who is doing this for God, he, there's no death threat over him because, again, anyone that lived in Israel would have this death threat over him. If you don't keep the laws, you will get killed. That's the laws here. You could keep the laws, you could leave. You could get killed. You got all three choices. You're choosing to leave, no problem. You're choosing to keep the laws, no problem. You're choosing to live here and not keep the laws, you're going to get killed. That's, that was a choice you made by your actions. But the non Jew who has no death threat over him, who's keeping the laws because he wants a relationship with God, not only is he called the Noahide, as is the other one, and he's called Hasid Umos Olam, he has a portion in Olam Haba. He has an afterlife. There's a special afterlife for the non-Jews, which, which I often say, I mean, often when it comes up, I mentioned this point, I think it's very, very special that if there's a, 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 a non-Jew you know, and you love them and you want to help them, look how important it is for them to keep the Noahide laws. It's literally giving them an olam haba, an afterlife, a spiritual afterlife. And there could be, I'm sure everyone in this call has people they know that are wonderful and kind and great people, but they're not keeping the laws of Noah. So maybe they're good, wonderful people, but they don't have Olam Haba. They don't have it. Because the only way you have Olam Haba, let me explain. I mean, Maimonides is legal. He's not explaining it, but I'm going to explain a little more. The energy of a non-Jew, if a non-Jew lived and died, wasn't especially evil, didn't keep the Noahide laws. Okay, so the energy just gets reformed and then another person's gonna live. Matter doesn't get wasted, then it's gonna be formed, another person will live. But for that person to live eternally, which is the idea of Olam Haba, they live on forever in the in the afterlife, in the like their spirit, their soul is connected and is receiving from God's energy is through the eternal quality of the mitzvah. Meaning when you serve God, right, that's the term mitzvah, a commandment, a mitzvah, the etymology of mitzvah is tzavsa, a tzavsa, which means a bond. So every time you serve God as a Noahide, you are doing a mitzvah. You're not serving idols. It's coming up. I mean, even this week, you know, you had the whole Halloween this week, um, which is definitely, you know, pagan-based and, and an idolatrous concept as, as well as anti-Semitic both, very idolatrous and very anti-Semitic. So you probably may, depending on your age, if you have children, they might have something you had struggled with or did not, but you're making a choice. You're saying, no, we don't survive those. We don't do that in this family. You know, December's coming up. No, we don't survive those. We don't do those things. No, I don't eat those foods. I do what God wants. I have to dress modestly. I do what God wants. I have to be honest. There's a million plus ways to be dishonest in this country and everyone's doing it, but I'm going to be honest. I've got to do what God wants. I've got to give charity. I've got to do what God wants. 
I can't gossip. I've got to do what God wants. I can't steal. I've got to do what God wants. There's so many ways I do what God wants. I have to restrain myself from what everyone else is doing and do what God wants. So every time you're doing the mitzvah, the commandment, there's a tzavsa. There's a bond form between your soul energy and God. And that bond is eternal. A mitzvah lasts forever. Forever. So every single mitzvah you do is what's creating for you olam haba, the afterlife. The idea of the eternal connection to God, the eternal reward of basking in God's energy created by every one of those mitzvahs. So if you didn't have the mitzvah, your soul has nothing to hold on to. There's no hope there of an eternal nature. And that's why there's no concept of an afterlife. So that's why it's really, really important for those people you love and have a connection to. Of course, family is like the hardest, but it's also the most important. Um, but of course, it is the hardest. So if anybody says, I can speak to anyone about my family, I totally understand because it's very hard to speak to your family. But it's really important because these are your family. To bring people to an awareness of God and an acceptance of serving God. Because there's many good people in this world that on their own do many of the Noahide laws just because they're good people, which is great, but doesn't count for what we're talking about. Because it's not a mitzvah then. For it to be the mitzvah, there has to be an awareness of God. God commands this and therefore I'm doing it. So if you have, you know, lovely friends that would never steal and would never lie and would never gossip and they give charity, but they're not doing it because of God, it's good. They're good people. We, we appreciate that they're good people and you appreciate that they're good people, but it's not a mitzvah. They're not a Noahide by that virtue. To be the Noahide, they have to be doing it because they know there's a God, they accept God, and because God commanded them, they're doing these things, which they naturally do because they're, they're from a more refined quality, and therefore they intuitively also know that this is the best way to behave. Now, obviously, if you're talking about someone who anyway does all these good things, maybe it's a little easier to get them to just accept God and do it for that reason, or maybe not. It depends on the person. Um, but that's the idea, that the non-Jew today, any non-Jew that's serving God as a Noahide is automatically Hasidah Umos Olam. We have no question on that because obviously there's no coercion of anyone, including non-Jews that live in Israel today. There's no coercion on anyone to keep God's laws. So obviously they're all Hasidic Umos Olam, and they all have a portion in the world to come. And as such, it's really important to try to help those people you have a connection to, those people you love, people you care about, to try to get them open. Like sometimes I feel it's like, you know, you plant a few seeds and you plant a few more seeds and you plant a few more seeds and you wait and you try again and you try again. You know, people you have a long-term relationship with, we could just keep trying to give them God's message again and again and again and again. And then slowly, 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 hopefully it's going to soak in and they're going to be able to on their own accept and live that way. And, and merit to the eternal life of one who serves God, who again, the reason only these people have eternal life, only reason only you have eternal life, is because your souls are bound up with the mitzvah. Every single time you serve God, it's a mitzvah, and a mitzvah is eternal, and as such, your soul has gained the eternal quality of the mitzvah, and therefore there is olam haba. But again, not for that fisherman who's making a good profit in Israel, and that's why he's doing it. But for what is relevant today, all the Noahides that we know of today are all the Hasidim al Olam. They're all doing it for God, and they all therefore have Olam Haba. Okay. So that was the end of chapter eight. Any questions on any of that? Again, I didn't do everything in chapter eight. I just pulled out the parts relevant for our discussion. Any other questions? Any questions on that? Okay. 
Have any of you tried to reach out to people that you uh, care about to try to get them to know the, to accept the truth? Larissa's like, oh yeah. Um, were, were you able to um, help people, Larissa, come to, a, come to some acceptance of God? Oh, sorry, hold on. Uh, working on it. <laughs> As I said, it's a long-term work. It's a long, we don't, we don't give up on people. Yeah. We give truth, we give truth, we give truth. There's plenty of people I've been working on for years. You know, plenty of Jews to try to get them to come closer to God. And it's, it's, we just keep believing, believe in the spirit of the person, believe in the truth and believe that when you're saying words that are true and they come from your heart, they are penetrating the other person. Anyone else have been trying to work with people they know? Danielle? I would like to say that I feel like it's been more difficult lately with everything with, I mean, I don't, I'm not, yeah, because I'm not physically going into work anymore, which was a lot of opportunity for like social interactions to kind of bring. Okay, you're, um, you're still, you're still working virtually? Yeah. Well, that's nice yeah. for you. <laughs> Save you a yeah. long drive. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank God. Um, I'm very grateful for that, but yeah, there's just not as many social opportunities anymore, at least in my life. Um, Right. So, um, I've definitely seen those type of connections and conversations being more minimal now, um, for me personally, um, but still working on my family, which, <laughs> you know, God willing, but, um, I, I do feel that for, at least for me, those interactions are much less than they used to be. It makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, the other side might be because of Corona, maybe even if you have a smaller interaction, but maybe people are more open and receptive. Like maybe people feel more yeah. vulnerable. They feel more, they need God. They feel more, this has been going on and on and on for eight months and become on. Yes. Know? Yes. So in that, yeah, definitely in that case, like I think I've shared on here a few times about people who I've never been able to even have a meaningful conversation related to a connection with God with them. And they have been sometimes starting it with me or they're like posting about their connection with God or, you know, thank God for this, or, you know, just, it's been amazing what I've seen from that perspective, but I guess more of like, um, more of a practical, like when it comes to conversations related to maybe making the right decision, the type of decisions that God wants you to make, um, related to the seven laws that don't come up as often anymore. Be a Facebook post. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, right. but that's just my perspective, but, but maybe, see, maybe the, no, I totally see what you're saying. Maybe the synergy is that maybe, I don't know if you're going back January 1st or whatever your company decided, but maybe whenever that point is, which of course I, I, I'm glad you got off. Uh, I'm glad God's letting you save you two hours a day, at least, yeah. you know, driving and all that, that, um, that maybe you'll find those conversations will go better because of what they've gone through over these past eight months that has maybe yeah. on some level made them more vulnerable, more humbled, yeah. Yeah. more aware point. of God. So now like, like, God did all this work for you over all, like the plowing was done over all these months. Now you come and you just put the seeds in and boom, it flowers because yeah. there was a lot of, a lot that the world ha is, not past tense, is going through. Yeah. A lot the world That's a great is point. going through. A great Anyone point. else has, has, has tried, you know, to reach out to people? I mean, I know it's hard. I know it's, uh, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's hard. And like in a sense, family is the hardest and sense family you have the most long-term relationship with. Oh my gosh. Who's that huge girl on the screen? <laughs> Who are you? Can you say hi? Hi. We can hear you. Say hi. 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 You look like so big. I would never recognize you. You are 15 already? <laughs> are you wow. 15 already? Come back. Yeah. It's Miss Turn. See her right here, Miss Turn. Hi. See? Hi. <laughs> Hi. Havana? <laughs> Hi. Hi. I miss you. You can come to my house. Can we? People live without masks. You want to go to Miss Turns? Yes. 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 
<laughs> okay, we'd be very excited to come. Now you get to see my grandchildren also. Um, oh, wow, that would be yeah. wonderful. Yeah, Gershom gets to meet Gershom. <laughs> Danielle's son is Gershom and my grandson's Gershom. So it sounds very similar. <laughs> and, and my grandchildren are by me for a few weeks because my daughter-in-law had a baby. Oh, wow. So it's, uh, yeah, very beautiful. Fun. All right, so that might be it. Might be an, an opportunity. That that was an invitation. So chapter Thank nine. You. So so now Maimonides now in chapter nine is going to start speaking about the laws of Noah, because here we got into the laws of Noah. We discussed what's a Noahide. Again, a Noahide in terms of legal has the same legality if he's the Ger Toshav who's in Israel to make a lot of money, or if he's the sincere. One of you, Hasidei Umos Olam Noachai. The laws are the same. It's in, in and the people could be doing them exactly the same, but God, of course, knows what's in the heart. And when in your heart, you're doing it for God. God says, "Wow, you're sincere. You're 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 that special child of mine, the righteous among the nations, the light among the nations, that's having an eternal life because of all the mitzvot, of all the connections you have to me." The Ger Toshav is doing it for his business. He's doing the same things, but God doesn't view it as that spiritual energy because it's just pragmatic. But the laws are the same for both groups. So we have six things that were originally commanded to Adam, meaning, as you probably all know, we have the laws of idolatry, not to curse, uh, not to kill, nothing immoral, not to steal, and courts. Those were the six laws that Adam got. The seventh, not to eat the limb of an animal, if it was cut up when the animal was still alive, was only given to Noah because until Noah's time after the flood, man was not allowed to eat animals. So everyone, I don't know if they were vegan, but they were all vegetarians. <laughs> From Adam till Noah, 10 generations of mankind, okay, did not touch meat because God didn't give them that right yet, because Noah and his families taking care of the animals for a year is what saved their lives on the physical plane. So then mankind was given the ability to eat meat in like in compensation for this. And therefore, once we could eat meat, we were given the seventh law about not eating the limb of a living animal if it was cut off when the animal was still alive. So from Adam on, the world now has a potential to be Noahides, which as we've discussed, I know we've discussed this, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all technically considered Noahides. The sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes, were all considered Noahides, right? The concept of Jew, in that sense, in a legal sense, begins at the giving of the Torah, about two and a half thousand years after creation. So the first two and a half thousand years, the potential was to be a uh, uh, a non-Noahide or a Noahide. That was, that was, that was, those were the options. So even though we say Abraham was the first Jew, and we say that, and that's truth to that, that's 100% true, but from a legal status, he was a Noahide, which is, I think, a very interesting concept to think of, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were Noahide, but the 12 tribes were Noahides from that perspective. So from the beginning of creation until Abraham, those were the seven laws, meaning Adam got the first six. If you wanted to be righteous and serve God, obviously at this point, anyone that's doing it is Hasidim Musa Olam, because the only concept of the coercion is once there is a Jewish nation living in Israel that has a penal system in place that would, ex would exercise this death sentence against you. So from the beginning of creation, until then, anyone that served God in this way was one of the righteous gentles, was one of the Hasidim of Olam. So from Adam, the world knew of six. From Noah, the world found out of seven. Now, Abraham, of course, many generations later, I mean, not even really so much. Abraham, Abraham was 54 when Noah passed away. So there was that, you know, we think of in terms of the generations, Noah went into the, 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 the flood happened when Noah was 600. Noah passed away, I'm not gonna give the exact year, but approximately when, when he was 950. 
meaning about 350 years after the flood. So Abraham was born about 300 years after the flood. Now already at that point, which is so interesting to see how man deteriorates so fast, in the time of Abraham, Abraham was born 300 years after the flood, already the world was a world of idolatry. So strange. Abraham, I calculated this out last week when it was the Torah portion of Noah of the flood. I think Abraham was like 20 something when they built the tower, you know, the concept of building the tower to, to try to fight against God. So look at this. So at that time, Abraham was ready. He was ready in his 20s. Noah was still alive. Noah's son, Shame, who was very righteous, was still alive. Shame's great grandson, Aver, who was very righteous, was still alive. Abraham's around. And yet look how, how quickly and how low the world fell. We're talking about 300 years. 300 years ago, God saved your family when all of mankind got washed away. Obviously, these people remember this. Even today, it's very interesting, in all ancient cultures, all ancient cultures over the entire world, including Chinese, including Indian, they all have in their culture something about the Great Flood, which makes sense, of course. They experienced it. The whole, again, even though at that moment everybody was living in the fertile crescent area of the world, and then some wandered all the way to China and some wandered all the way to America, but they all originally are descendants of Noah and his three sons. So everyone in the world experienced the Great Flood. Everyone in the world knew, again, now let's not talk about nowadays or 3,000 years ago. Let's talk about 300 years after the flood. They knew God washed away the world. They knew they were the only ones saved. They knew God saved them. And so they were idolatrous. So hard to fathom how fast man fell. But Abraham comes on the scene. I'm saying some 300 years after the flood. At this point, all of the survivors of the flood that are now the population of the world, they're all idolatrous. And Abraham is coming as this great beacon of light to bring the world to a recognition of God. Because when Abraham was born, the world didn't have any recognition of God. There were still holy people around. Noah was still lived. I'm saying Abraham was in, I think it was 54 when Noah passed away. Shame, Noah's son was very righteous. Aver, Noah's great, great grandson was very righteous. And yet the world was totally separate from God. And Abraham had his mission statement from God to connect the world back to God. And Abraham was given another additional commandment. Again, until this point in the world, the only commandments that there were, were the seven Noahide laws. That was it. There were no other laws. Abraham was given by God, as we see in today's Torah portion, the commandment to circumcise himself. He received this commandment from God when he was 99 years old. And this was unusual in that the commandment of circumcision was like the commandments that we received and did after the giving of the Torah. Because before the giving of the Torah, the giving of the Torah was in 2448, about two and a half thousand years after creation. And until that time, when man served God, the world didn't change. You do what you were supposed to do, but the world stayed the same corporeal, coarse, detached from God world. You gave charity, that's great. You're doing what God wants, but the, the money doesn't shift its energy because you gave charity. You know, you're not eating this food and you're eating this food because that's what God commands. Great. But the food doesn't change its energy. Nowadays, of course, it does. Nowadays, as we serve God, if you give charity, the energy of the coins literally changes. If you don't eat a certain food and do eat a certain food, the energy is changing. If you're dressing in a more modest fashion, the energy is changing. But that only happened after God gave the Torah to the world in 2448. Until that time, you could serve God. Noah served God his whole life. Shame, his son, served God his whole life. Aver, his great-great-grandson, served God his whole life. They served God and did many, many things. But those things didn't change the energy of the world. And Abraham served God for 99 years. Did many, many, many things for God, but didn't change the energy of the world. The only thing that changed the energy of the world was when Abraham circumcised himself. Because God at this moment opened up a new channel, a channel that the physical and the spiritual 
can fuse. That there's a synergy of the physical and spiritual. So on that one limb of Abraham's physical body, that piece of physical flesh, that most coarse, in a sense, part of our body, piece of physical flesh, is now godly. Because God's will was done to that limb of Abraham's body, to that foreskin. And that made that place of the foreskin physical and holy. And that was the first time since creation that the physical ever became holy. Again, people serve God. Adam was very holy. You know, I mean, there were many holy people that lived on this world before this. Mr. Shelah, who would live the longest of any person, 900, I don't remember how many years, close to a thousand years. He was very holy. He served God with many, many, many mitzvahs. But there was never a synergy that the physical became spiritual because of his action. For the first time that happened, when God commanded Abraham to circumcise himself at age 99. So that opened up a whole new dimension in this world, the concept of circumcision and the concept that the physical and spiritual are going to converge and the physical is going to become spiritual while still retaining itself as physical. In a similar way, we view the land of Israel. It's a physical piece of land. But it's spiritual. It's God's chosen land. But it's still physical. Exactly. That's the idea. That the physical and the spiritual come together. Something retains itself as physical, but has shifted to an energy of spiritual. The circumcision is a place in our body that has this concept. And the land of Israel is geographically the topography that has this concept. Um, okay. So we, we are right in the middle here, and I, I see that the time is over. I get a little clock that I can look at if I slot glance at the bottom of my screen. Any questions or comments on, on anything before we stop? Well, this was so nice for me because I got to see everyone's faces. So I appreciated that. That was nice. Was this better for you guys or worse, and is it easier on the phone? What do you feel? Marlena? I liked it better. <laughs> you liked it better. Okay. Yeah, you liked it better. It's easier to focus when you see someone's face, see the faces. Yeah. Great. 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 I did like getting to see everybody too. You also like saying, I, I also yeah. like it. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm showing up is still here. Uh -huh. We've been doing this for years. I can finally see what everyone looks like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you have a face, you have a connection to the person. You know, as we say, you know, on the face, is the inner dimension of the person shining through. So it's nice to see everyone's faces. So I'm glad this worked for us. I don't know if anyone didn't come because they had techno technological challenges. <coughs> did, did Danielle, did anyone reach out to you and say that? Yeah, a few people said that they couldn't download the app on their phone, um, but I, I don't know, that was two people. Um, but there were several people that said they were gonna be able to make it because they couldn't previously because it costs too much for them to call in. But oh. since Zoom is free, because they live internationally, but um, so I was surprised but that they didn't join, but I'll reach well, out to them. You'll reach out to hopefully. them and say it worked yeah. and Zoom is still free. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay, so so this works for you, Larissa. You you know all about Zoom. Right. It's funny because I um I was, I've used Zoom for years because I teach a, a, a seminar teaching teachers how to teach Rashi and Chumash. So years ago when I started the seminar, I looked around for a good forum and there's, there are a number of, of platforms like Zoom and, and I was going crazy. Like I, being me, I had already scheduled the, the class before I figured out the platform I was using and how I was going to do it. And it was literally like, like I was supposed to give the class in a few hours and everything was like crazy and incredibly expensive and incredibly complicated and with no support like customer support was ridiculous and then like I stumbled across zoom and I'm like oh my gosh this is like the best it's so much more economical it it, it works and it, it it's so simple to use and it does everything I need it was awesome Dixie you're just coming as we're leaving oh no did you did you not did this when Chavez came out by you is that the problem I see Dixie's name. She's connecting. She's joining. She got it. Yeah, I, I did see her face in a second. Dixie, hi. What happened? 
I didn't realize you were on Zoom. I couldn't find you guys. Oh. <laughs> Danielle, that was your responsibility. <laughs> what happened? We're blaming Danielle. How did you find us then? Well, I finally found Danielle's message. Oh, oh, so Danielle sent the message. Okay, fine. Yeah. I, I just never usually go there. I was uh, looking well, so I messed wait. up. No, you didn't mess up. Do, do you have WhatsApp, Dixie? Uh, yeah, I do, but I don't go there. I was looking under my um, my Facebook, and I find, and it's on there, too, but I don't usually go to the place where it's at. Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm glad but, you found us, just yeah. as it's ended, and you're going to know for next week. <laughs> And we changed the time to eight o'clock Chicago time. I don't know what time that is by you. Is that six or seven by you? I don't know. Seven. 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 That's good. Okay. And that's yeah. fine because the clock changes next week. Shabbos will be over around five. So no conflict. Yeah. And hmm. Okay. Wow. All right. You see, <laughs> I wouldn't know if it was on Facebook either. <laughs> but I look at WhatsApp. So um, everyone has the social media that works for them. For me, WhatsApp works. And I, I'm, I'm not, I don't know Facebook at all. Um, okay. Great. So we're, we'll, we'll, uh, all right. We are ending now and we'll figure this out for you. Make this work for you. But I'm glad oh, you found God. us. Sorry, I was actually wondering where you were. I was like, hmm, I wonder if Dixie can't do Zoom. Like I was wondering why I didn't see you on. But no, I, I can do Zoom. I just didn't get my ducks together. That's all. <laughs> no problem. No problem. No problem. Okay. Listen, but you did. Everything is a hand of God and this is exactly how it was supposed to be. All right, right, so we look forward to next week. So eight o'clock Chicago time, whatever that time is for everyone here is different. I guess Marlene it's six and Corey it's uh, nine. And uh, you know, each person where they are that, uh, you know, that, that it should work for them. All right, have a wonderful week. It was great seeing everyone. Shabbat you too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much. You. Have a wonderful bye. Day. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay.